Hey everyone, Rarity Dash here. Time for another Patreon sponsored Blind Reaction. And this one comes to you courtesy of Mario Fanboy15, who has requested that I react to another video from the Angry Video Game Nerd. This time it's something a bit different, however, it's the making of an Angry Video Game Nerd episode. So, um, yeah, that should be kind of cool. I mean, I know from that one video that I watched that James takes his filmmaking rather seriously, so uh, more could go into the making of an episode of the show than I would typically think for the, for an episode of, like, a web series. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure what the steps would be for this. Uh, I mean, it seems like a pretty well-produced show for what it is. Um, but, yeah, I have really no idea all of what goes into it. I, I assume it is definitely a lot more than what we see. So, uh, yeah, really curious to find out what his process is. Um... This should be kind of enlightening, so let's get started and find out. Here we go. Alright, yeah. <laughs> A lot of editing. I'm going to talk about what goes into making an AVGN episode. Cool. Now, since day one, fans have expressed genuine interest in what goes into making an episode, and many of you have asked perfectly legit questions on my site, Cinemassacre.com. I think one of the reasons I held off on doing this for so long is because I kind of just take for granted that there is a lot that goes into making these videos. See, for me, I don't really think about it that much because I've made over a hundred episodes and I've become very efficient at it. Yeah. So to me, it's like the same way I don't think about brushing my teeth. You know, I do it so many times. Um, my background is in filmmaking, so mm -hmm. to me, making game reviews is a much simpler process than making movies. So I kind of forgot that well, there is a lot that goes into making these game reviews, and uh, there's actually so much that I could sit here for like three hours, and still, you know, there could be <laughs> more things to talk about. That I well, luckily this is only 35 minutes. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the making of a simple episode. Um, really elaborate episodes like Crazy Castle, Ninja Gaiden, Rob the Robot, those are like a whole other level of production. So... Hmm. Um, but you can see the main yeah, when there's more like skits and stuff on uh, the bonus features on the AVGN Volume Four DVD. Anyway, I'm just going to talk about <laughs> then it the becomes like an actual a basic film. nerd episode from start to finish. I'm going to document the whole process. Now it's not going to be a like a full episode. It's going to be like a like a short sample of an episode. So this is just a demonstration. Let's pick a game. Now the whole uh, fate of the video, whether it turns out good or not. It all depends on the choice of game. You know, it has to be bad. Makes sense. It has to have some funny things to say about it and everything. Um, for some reason, the ones that always turn out the best, I think, are the NES games. I don't know why, but it just seems like NES is like my safe zone. Now, there's two kinds of games. There's ones that I Did remember from the my youth. Angry Nintendo and then nerd. there's ones that I just found out about, like the Atari porn games, for example. I didn't know about those when I was a kid. <laughs> So um, I had a hit list, you know, in the beginning, like just a list of all games I wanted to do. But then there'd be new discoveries that would come along all the time. Of course. You know? I'd get some requests maybe, and like the requests help steer my decision, you know. Like How I'll, it should be. I'll go to a game that I've always wanted to do. Gotta listen like, to the audience. You know, like Jaws was one, uh, Fester's Quest, you know, I wanted to do that from the beginning. But then I'll find out about a game like, plumbers don't wear ties and it's like oh wow that'll make <laughs> that sounds one. great so um when i was doing these like two videos a month like i didn't really have much time to pick a game i had to you know just go to my list and go to the next one that was in line but um you know it, it's better when i when i have more time to just sit around and play some of these got games. a lot of games so, like, by the way <laughs> decide which one will make the best video it's quite the collection it also depends a lot how many other video projects i'm working on at the moment and how busy my personal life is uh like the rob the robot video for example i knew that that video was going to take me a whole month to do so like for now for example let's pick uh you know oh. barbie i mean you know you look you look at this and it's like okay that that's got to be bad. Yeah, you know? but we don't know till we play it. Let let's try. <laughs> now while I'm playing the game, I'm also recording it because I record Barbie everything I play. Kind of low hanging fruit recorder. there. 
but uh, every system I have here is connected to the DVD recorder and then of course goes to the TV so I can see it um, how do you connect this many systems I'm sure the game isn't thing? great it's a mess it is not recommended but um what I do uh, well a lot of them use coaxial cables which suck um, mm -hmm. you can see right over there they all go into uh, a splitter which goes into the back of the VCR here and then for all the ones that use these uh, you know RCA composite video cables they go into these different switchers we have switcher A switcher B and switcher C now it's very hard to keep track of this so that's why I have yeah, a that's a rather complicated setup track. Uh, say, for example, I want to play the CDI. I don't know why I'd ever want to play that, <laughs> but it would go to uh, switcher C would be set to 4, VCR would be set to line 2, and the DVDR would be set to line 1. The AC adapters are an outstanding mess. I do not recommend this. You could risk an electrical hazard, but uh, I've been doing it pretty safely because I have surge protectors. I never turn on more than one system at a time. Good. And when they're not in use, I turn them off. No matter how simple, every video involves the same steps. Playing the game, writing the script, shooting the video and recording the voiceover, and editing the Makes video. Makes sense. It's never been any different. You can't just hit record and have it all happen instantaneously. We could try it, though. Okay, so Barbie <laughs> loves reading about mermaids. Mm -hmm. Okay, she's getting sleepy. Uh, so see, I can't think of much to say about this. Yeah. Okay, so the game starts. All right. All uh, right, she jumps pretty damn slow. There's a bunch of bees. There's a ball. I mean, this is pretty much what I do. Tennis racket. There's a little <laughs> dog. Uh. Shitting out baseballs. Um. Um. There's Toucan Sam. Can't figure yeah. out how to get past the wall. I'm gonna throw a ball to Toucan Sam. Nothing's happening. You see, this game is giving me some possibilities, but uh, I'm not an improv kind of guy, so I can't just <laughs> run through it like this and spit out creative gold. I gotta go through it and, and develop it some. So at this point, I'm just trying to decide if I want to use this game or not for the video. And um, if I don't think it's working out, like, you know, I'll give it like 15 minutes and then I'll turn it off and I'll try something else. Okay. Um, if I think, yeah, like this is workable, I, I can do this. Then kind of a that's quick when decision. it goes from casual gaming to making a nerd episode. So this is the point of no return. I'll get out my laptop or a notepad and I'll start writing down notes. What am I writing? anything I think I might want to use for the video. I, I come across something in the game, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to want to remember that. I write it down. And um, a lot of times Mike is here, and he'll be helping me out write the notes. Sometimes I'll, just, I'll be playing, and then he'll be writing the notes, so I don't have to keep pausing and doing double duty. Uh, most of the time, it's just me. Um, I'm also writing down the time codes for everything that happens. You can see the time code right on the, on the DVD recorder. It's going to be handy later to be able to find all these parts again because I might have hours and hours of footage and then I'll just be scanning through to you know try to locate this so writing down the time code and all that it may seem like a lot of extra work at first but in the long run it's gonna save a lot of time now of course as Makes I'm sense. playing the game I'm recording it and I'm recording my own authentic experience of, of playing of playing through it so um, when you see me die in the game I'm really dying I don't pretend to do it at, like I used to like in the Karate Kid video um, like I was deliberately running into enemies and yeah. on purpose but I, I don't do that anymore now I make sure that w everything I play is authentic a big question is how long do I play the game well basically once I have enough notes and enough material to work with then the job's done but um, I want to feel complete I don't always have to beat the game, but I want to make sure that I think I found everything in the game that I'm going to want to talk about. Um, um, you know, and I, and I don't know what was that? until I play it. Um, <laughs> if there's something later in the game, like if I know that there's something at the end that I want to show, 
Sometimes I'll use a password or a code or something, but not very often because then I'll always regret missing something, you know, down the line. Like um, in the, the Ninja Turtle video, uh, I didn't even show the Technodrome, and, and that was a big part of the game. So I always regretted that later on. So I, I never want to feel like I'm missing anything. Um, you know, this is all just about playing the game authentic. Like a lot of people ask, why don't I use emulators? And like I, I know on emulators, from what I understand, there's like ways to cheat and like skip through the game and stuff. Save that's, states. That's not the point. Like I need to really play it. And I also just couldn't see myself like hunched over at it at a keyboard playing. Like no, playing a game is sitting back on a couch with a controller in my hand. I respect that. This is it. This is the real deal. Playing the game is the easiest part. Now comes writing the script. This is the most unpredictable phase of the whole production because. It just depends what kind of mood I'm in. I could just stare at a blank screen and I'm just not <laughs> feeling creative and like the ideas just aren't coming. So then usually I have to like distance myself from it for a bit, go work on a different project or do something different. And then other times I'm not even trying and then the ideas will come when I'm not home or if I'm in yeah. bed. And I can't go to sleep that's until how, I write it down. So that's how writing the writing is. writing process just depends what kind of mood I'm in. So basically what I'm doing here, I'm taking all my notes and I'm putting them all into like categories. I'm just organizing everything so that it's not just um, constant rambling. It actually has some kind of structure. Like I'll take all the parts where I'm talking about the graphics and I'll put that all in its own section. And then I'll take all the parts where I'm talking about weird enemies and I'll do the same for that and I'll kind of structure the whole script so it has like a beginning a middle and an end any Seems research logical. I need to do on the game like if I want to talk about the history behind it or anything important that you need to know I do that now uh, like if I want to talk about Barbie where Barbie came from or something I do that now um, also talking about the control of the game like how it plays like you know, I don't want to go too in depth because if I if I describe the game too much, I just start to sound like an instructional man. Yeah, you know, I, yeah. I want it to be funny too, but being funny is the hardest part because it, it just has to come natural. Like I can't really force humor. You know, I'm gonna just try this out. I mean, what's the meaning behind Barbie dreaming about balls? <laughs> uh, this has got to be a ball joke. Swearing is an angry nerd tradition. I gotta keep that going, but um, it has exhausted its vocabulary. Um, words are words. My favorite parts are when the nerd is not speaking, when it's all in the facial expressions. I always considered myself a visual artist and never considered writing my best skill, uh, but I just work at it until I think it's good. Um, a lot of bad habits I have are tongue twisters, sentences that go on too long, unintentional rhyming, unintentional alliteration, words that repeat too often. Every time you fall down, you have to walk through the entire room all over again. All the enemies come back, so you have to fight everybody all over again. Yeah. And whenever I use the same word a lot, like uh, the Ninja Gaiden video, the original script I said impossible like five times. Uh, so I changed <laughs> it and basically... Yeah, I, I have some of the same the problems. Script, and then if I see... A word repeated too often I use a thesaurus so I think using a thesaurus is very important it helps a lot sometimes you gotta so once I finish the script it's time to record the voiceover equipment nothing special Samson mic about fifty dollars hmm. pop filter about thirty dollars and a Lisus mixer about a hundred okay. voiceover is a required skill you have to be able to act with your voice and you know be able to read it and make it sound natural. Um, I used to have a full-time job doing corporate videos, and a big part of the job oh, was that's kind of surprising. voiceovers and directing many different narrators, and lots of people had problems with it. So I saw what all the issues were, and I learned through experience. Um, but still, I'm not perfect. What the hell is going on? And there's fish that flop. <clears throat> and there's fish that flop all over. Oh, this is. Ugh, this is actually way more difficult than I thought. Ah, fuck! 
<laughs> there are rare exceptions when I can't recreate an authentic reaction from the game. Like, oh, fuck, shit. Um, you know, it's like sometimes I need to actually see the game and see what's happening. So for some of those parts, I will actually like watch my footage while I'm recording it or play the game and try to record my voiceover as it's happening. So th that, it doesn't happen that often, but sometimes I'll do parts like that and do a little like improv. Okay. And the next step is the shooting. Notice how I put certain paragraphs in boldface. Well, That's the ones because these sections to the are camera. intended for on screen, meaning this is when you see the nerd. So now it's time to shoot the video. Technically, I could have done the voiceover um, after the shooting. You know, it doesn't really matter what order I do it in. But uh, as you can see, I have plenty of nerd shirts because they get fucked up all the time. Hmm. Blood stains, shit stains, missing buttons, whatever. As far as lighting goes, I've used all kinds of different things in the nerd videos. Sometimes something as simple as a desk lamp with a piece of paper to soften it. You know, and I've used uh, the pro light here on most of them. So, whatever you uh, want to use, just try experimenting. Yeah, that's cool. I've used all kinds of different lighting setups in the nerd videos, Gotta and it's used all light. kinds of different results. All right, so now we're set up to shoot some nerd. Uh, this is a Sennheiser microphone, about five hundred bucks. Uh, wow. This one, this is my camera. I used to use a Panasonic DVX. I just switched to an HVX, which is what this is. Um, used, it was about three grand. Uh, okay. With batteries and everything. Okay. So well, I mean, he is a filmmaker, so I guess it makes because, sense from have that. Um, I'm plugging it straight in. I don't, I don't think I'll be buying one of those, but. Audio hardware or anything. So, um, what I get on this microphone is a very shallow range. It's always too quiet or too loud. And. You know, you could adjust that in the editing, but there's only so much you can do. Uh, you want to try to get the audio right the first time when you're recording, because if not, then uh, you're raising the audio levels when it's quiet, and then you get lots of background noise. And then when it's loud and you bring it down, it's still not going to help with uh, distortion. You know, that when the audio peaks, it yeah. gets all muffled up. So, um, basically, this records on two separate tracks, and you can see I have them both adjusted a little differently. So this is where I adjust them. I'll have one set for when the nerd is speaking normally, and then I'll have the other one set for when I'm shouting. And that way, in the editing, I can switch between the two tracks as needed. Hmm. Right, That's handy. This shot here. Sometimes I have friends helping out, but uh, most of the time I'm a one-man crew. Just gonna focus this here. All right, gonna close down the iris. All right, and that should be pretty good. And we got the pens, almost. Hmm. Actually, they're Sharpies, but you wouldn't believe how many times I've shot takes and then realized I forgot the pens. Oh yeah, it happens. So right now I'm rehearsing off the script because unlike the uh, voiceover segments where I'm reading, this time I have to memorize it. Um, I choose not to use a teleprompter or anything like that. Uh, in fact, in the old days, I used to tape the script like over here or to near the TV or wherever it was, and um, I would just read off of it. Yeah. So now I don't do that. I better, look at the better TV to memorize. Like I'm, you know, focused on the TV and then shift my attention to the audience here and there. Um, but the script, I just memorize it. And if I do forget some of the lines, um, I'll give myself freedom to improvise here. So if I come up with something new on the spot, I'll allow myself to, to cool. do that, to just act in the moment. Makes Fucking sense. Barbie, you plastic pink mall shopping, bimbo ball craving, bird riding, ghost fighting, fish flopping, <laughs> psycho dreaming, harebrain piece of shit. Plastic pink. That's going to be hard to remember. Shopping, bimbo ball craving, bird riding, ghost fighting. Fucking Barbie, you fucking pink plastic. Yeah. Fuck this game. Fucking Barbie, you fucking pink plastic mall shopping, ball brain, fish flopping, ball. <coughs> Now I'll get shots of the game cartridge or anything else I need. Hmm. Now we're up to the editing. Now the editing is a big part. I'm not yeah. going to give a whole editing class and teach you how to edit, but 
Um, lots of people ask, what kind of editing software do I use? Well, use whatever works for you. Um, but uh, what I use is Final Cut Pro. That's what I've been using for the past. What a lot of people use. So, um, before that, I've used Adobe Premiere. I've used Avid, but then I went Mac and never went back. Hmm. The first step is editing the voiceover because the voiceover is the whole skeleton which you build on top of. The voiceover dictates the whole video. So basically, what I'm doing here, I'm cutting out all the pauses and all my mistakes. It's KDE in life for me, by the way. Here. If Dude, anyone's the curious, craziest psychopaths on earth don't dream this shit. I'm going to stop it there, and there it's gone, and here's Even the second. Even the craziest psychopaths on earth don't dream this shit. And usually the second take is better. Um, like right Was here, a little I, better? Can, I can tell by, just by the waveform that this is two takes of the same thing. Yeah. So I'm not even going to bother to listen to the first one and save myself time. So usually I just scrub through, and then I just take it here and delete it. Of course, I'm editing with one hand right now, but hmm. still. And there's fish that flop. <clears throat> Usually, once I have the voiceover cut, I'll start to adjust all the, the parts where I'm like, you know, shouting. Like, you know, I want to keep the audio levels consistent. So I'm going to bring it up here when I'm like talking softly. And then when a part comes where I'm like shouting, then I'll bring the, the volume down, you know. And then here I'm kind of like in between, so I'll like bring it up maybe there, and you know, and that's how it goes. So after I have the voiceover parts all edited, now I'm editing the, the visual portion. So I'm laying down all the game clips on top of uh, the voiceover uh, to match what I'm talking about. So I'll cut it to the rhythm of my voice so that everything matches up. Um, let's see what I'm talking about here. There's a puppy dog that's helping her attack evil stockings or something. Okay, so there, there's a part where like a dog's attacking like a piece of clothing or something. So I could scrub through this footage. <laughs> where is that part? Where Where is that? You know, this could be like, you know, say this was a normal situation where I'd have like maybe two hours of game footage and maybe even more, you know. Uh, like those Zelda CDI videos, like each one of those was seven hours each. Oh. Um, so... You know, it could take a while to find that part again, so that's why the time codes come in handy. So, yeah, I'll bring up uh, my time codes, and here we go. 1520, I have the dog ate the stocking or whatever, so now I'll go to 1520. Okay, somewhere around here. And there we go. Now, say I make a reference to another game, like I need a clip from, like, just for example, like, say, Terminator, then uh, if I know I already have footage of the Terminator game, or whatever it is I'm looking for, then I'll bring up this list I have here, and this is my archives, this is all the game footage I have recorded. It just goes on and on and on, so this could take forever to find it, so I'll just do a search like this, I'll do Terminator, you know, and there we go, there's my Terminator clips. How do I find it? 559. So these are my archives, these big ass books full of DVDs. So I got the book and page number, book 5 and page 59. Wow. And there it is. Like I said, I record every game I play and it always comes in handy later. Like say I want to show the ending of Super Metroid, that could take a I long doubt he time still records play, on DVD. But I already have it recorded. In the old days, I used to record on VHS till I started taking this more serious. If I want to take well, a maybe from a previous nerd episode, like Simon's Quest for the nine millionth time, I can go on one of my hard drives, and here I have instant access to all nerd episodes. And if I really need some old raw footage, I always have my old mini DV tapes. So once you have all the clips where they're supposed to go, now we start the sound editing. So this is basically where we try to even out the, the game music with the voiceover so that everything sounds balanced. Like if you listen to it right now. Oh, yeah. And there's fish that See, it's like, you know, the Gotta music bring is the game loud, to the so I'm bring it down. And um, basically what I'm gonna do here, a part where like I'm not speaking, if there's like a little pause, I will bring the music up so that, you know, the music will kinda like ramp up as I as I pause so something like this and there's fish that flop all over 
this is, and I'm gonna do that to the whole, you know, thing. I'm gonna even out everything. Cool. One thing that gets really tricky about sound editing is trying to keep the music sounding like smooth. Uh, like if you take a game like Super Pitfall and you hear the music. It's awful, it repeats all the time, but you get that melody in your head and it actually sounds worse when it's edited because then it's all chopped up, sounds something like this. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that could be distracting. So, you know, it's a little disorienting to the ears, uh, especially if it's a game with a very recognizable tune like Michael Jackson's Moonwalker and you got all those Michael Jackson songs. It's like, you know, it just doesn't sound right when it's been edited. So what I do in these situations is I try to look for the parts that I don't really care much about. Like, like maybe this part, there isn't really any key sound effect there. There's no reason I need that, so I'll get rid of that. And then I'll stretch this part out, you know, hmm. to, to fill it up. And then, you know, I might end up using, like, some cross dissolves and, like, smooth it out a bit. So huh? it's basically like one big tricky puzzle just to make, you know, make the sound as good as it can be. Now, the best cool. solution to this, which is way more time-consuming than it's worth, is actually to uh, go back to the beginning of the game, record, like, one, like, constant music loop without any sound effects in it, and then record all the sound effects clean. Like, sometimes in the beginning of a game, there's, like, a sound test, and you can get all the sound effects. And then, basically, go back to all your edits and just lay down yeah, one constant Yeah, that's probably more trouble than it's worth. Loops and then put all the sound effects back in. Uh, it solves the problem, but it is very time y Yeah, and, uh, you don't need to do that. I have not done that very often. Just to give you an idea how complicated these projects oh, wow. can get sometimes. Oh, this is God. An old timeline from the Super Mario Brothers 3 video where Super Mecha Death Christ is fighting uh, um, the devil. Um, you can see there's okay. tons and tons of sound effects going on here. Uh, lots and lots <laughs> of visual effects. Um, kind of want to see you know, that now. And, uh, um, it's not really the best example unless I was actually working on it right now because these clips aren't connected anymore because um, it's an old project. But I will tell Makes you sense. a little bit about the visual effects. With effects, sometimes I'll use After Effects or a program like that. But usually everything I do uh, is just Photoshop and Final Cut. Like I do all the graphics in Photoshop and then I do all the animation in Final Cut. Uh, it's as simple as that. That's the, the simplest solution because these are you know quick web videos and I got to get them out really, really fast. Uh, one time uh, Mike and I were at a bar. We were talking to Dave Willis from Aqua Teen Hunger Force, cool. the voice of Meat Wad and Carl, and uh, we were asking him about effects, and he said, just do it in Photoshop, and that's something I've lived by ever since. Photoshop is like duct tape. It fixes everything. A lot of times when I shoot videos, I make mistakes. In the Rob episode, for example, I accidentally left the gyros on Rob, but this was before I'm supposed to have the gyros, so I actually had to Photoshop ah. them out frame by frame. I have to decide if it's worth reshooting or not, and usually it's quicker to just do it in Photoshop. Yeah. Sometimes there's a script in the shot. Or it does sound like a lot of work, though. Parts like these, I don't even have to use Photoshop. I can do it all in Final Cut, just by taking a part of the video that doesn't have it and then lay it on top of the footage. It's seamless, and you never notice. Color correction is hmm. something that I also got to do. Even though this is less cinematic than a movie, still, I got to adjust the colors. The original Silver Surfer video was an example of me forgetting to color correct. The whole video had an orange tone. Yeah. After everything's done, it's still not done. It's never done when I think it is. Because I'll always notice some kind of mistake at the last minute. So usually when I finish these videos, I like to give it some time, go do something else, come back with a fresh mind and look at it. Um, I show it to friends. Uh, usually the first person to see it is Mike. 
and uh, usually somebody will catch some mistake I made. Like uh, the funniest one I can think of is in the, the Street Fighter 2010 video. I was describing the final boss and I said he looked like Grimace from Sesame Street. Grimace is not from Sesame yeah. Street. He's from McDonald's. So luckily somebody caught that. But other things that I have to fix are more technical. Like sometimes when I'm looking at the game footage in Final Cut, something will actually look different once the video has been finalized and compressed. Like, for example, in the Double Dragon 3 video, there was a part where I was talking about how when there's lots of enemies on the screen, they all flicker. But in the final video, they didn't look that way anymore. So it's strange. And, um... Uh, like the Castlevania videos, I remember when uh, the character goes into that post-hit invincibility, you know, when they're flickering, uh, it didn't show up that way. Instead, the character was like invisible and you couldn't even see what was going on. Hmm. So things like that just look different. Uh, there's one where I was talking about a glitch in the game where you can only see the character's head. It was just this like disembodied head. In the final video, you saw the whole body. So it's just something you can't predict it has to do with like changes in the frame rate or the field dominance or something like that that I can't always pinpoint so in these situations I usually just cut those parts makes sense so in a nutshell that's how a nerd video is made um, how long does the whole process take well it depends on the video it depends on the game it depends on the level of production uh, I'd say on average, um, probably 30 to 40 hours for one video. Wow. I always keep an hourly log of every video I do just to see how fast I can do. You know, because for me, it's kind of like a game. See if I could beat my record. The Dragon's Lair video, for example, was one of the shorter ones. That one took only 16 hours. The Rob the Robot video, now that one took <laughs> two and a half hours. While I was editing the effects for the Rob video, while I was animating all those lasers and shit, I had time to actually listen to every one of these Iron Maiden CDs, plus the live albums. That's how long it took. I'm always listening to music when I edit, unless cool. it's involving voiceover oh. or any kind of yeah, audio. Yeah. Uh, music is the only thing that keeps me sane. Um, well... That's pretty much it. The, the, uh, the hardest thing about making the videos is just finding time to make them, uh, trying to balance them with my personal life because I have so much other crap going on. It's hard not to be distracted by other things all the time. Like say the video takes 40 hours to make, I might only get three hours a day to, to work on it. So uh, it's, there's no easy shortcuts. It's a time consuming procedure, but it's nice to know that so many people are watching. So thank you for making it worthwhile. Uh, I know there's a lot of other questions that, you know, I, I could address. So if, if you have any other questions, just leave them on my site uh, in the comment section on Cinemaster.com underneath the video. And uh, maybe I'll do another Q&A of some form later um, and address some of them. So uh, thanks, and let's check out the Barbie video. No degeneracy is low enough to satisfy the shit-seeking gamer who decides to play Barbie <laughs> on NES. Whew. We know that most NES games were targeted towards young boys, so here's one for the girls. As an adult male, why would I ever want to play this? Because I'm pathetic and I'm asking for hell! It starts with the most casual intro for any game I've ever seen. Barbie's reading a book about mermaids. Then she talks about going to bed and actually begins listing all the things she's going to do the next day. Swimming at the beach, having lunch, shopping at the mall, and meeting Ken at a party. Sounds like an exciting game already! Then yeah! She goes to sleep and the game begins. I wonder if this is supposed to be a real human Barbie or a plastic doll Barbie. From the way she moves, I'd say she's a plastic doll. Yeah. So the game is actually her dream, in case you ever wanted to know what Barbie dreams about. She dreams about a nursery that's been overtaken by a poltergeist. <laughs> Tennis rackets are hidden balls all over the place. There's clothing flying around. She has to fight the invisible woman. There's a puppy dog that's helping her attack evil stockings or something. Toucan Sam gives her a lift. I wonder if there's oh, any okay. psychological meaning behind these dreams. Barbie's really <laughs> fucked up in the head. Even the craziest psychopaths on earth don't dream this shit. The wallpaper's covered in roses, teddy bears, and baseballs. Guess you can say this game is balls to the wall.
I can't help but notice how many balls are in the game. They're everywhere. Perhaps the meaning behind this is because she's obsessed with Ken's balls. The first boss battle is like you're fighting a window shutter or a laundry chute that causes earthquakes and shoots beach balls. What the hell is going on? What's stranger is how you beat the boss. You have to select the double arrow and throw your thingamajig at the cat, which causes the cat to attack the laundry chute or whatever it is. Um. Then there's a part where you have to walk through a never-ending mall of fountains that shoot water up her dress. And there's fish that flop all over. Okay. This is one of those parts where you have to get the pattern down. It takes time and patience, but it never fucking ends. Ugh, this is actually way more difficult than I thought. Ugh. Ugh. I just got my ass handed to me by a Barbie game. This game was made for little girls, and I can't even get past the first few stages. Fuck this game. Fucking Barbie. <laughs> Here Black we go. Pink moss shopping, bimbo ball craving, bird riding, ghost fighting, fish flopping, psycho dreaming, hairbrain piece of shit. Go to hell. Well done. <laughs> well done, James. Well, there we go. Got a little mini episode there at the end, and uh, <laughs> it was pretty good. <laughs> I learned a lot about his process, and as I would have, as I kind of thought at the start, there definitely is a lot more that goes into it than uh, than you'd really think. Um, I'm not surprised he has really a, a really expensive setup with like a high quality camera, since filmmaking is his hobby. Um, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely quite the setup there, yeah, but I mean it's not all about that. It's about the work that he puts into it. He really is committed to making his videos in a specific way, and I, I really respect that. I mean, I already really respected the guy just from that other video I watched, but uh, this just kind of drives it home a bit. Um, kind of, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, Yeah, it was it was just really cool to see that see his editing process, um, and his uh, and just the whole thing. I mean, recording it it really makes sense a lot of what he does. It, it, it seems like the right way to do something like this. Um, my videos don't really take a lot of editing because it's just a reaction, um, and. Uh, yeah, I could probably stand to do a little more editing, but I, I just, I mean, at this point, probably won't get done if I <laughs> try and increase the production value. Um, but if I ever do, like, more editing videos again, maybe maybe some of those tricks are things I could do. I mean, obviously, Katie in, Katie in Live is uh, different than Final Cut, but uh, it's uh, ultimately all pretty similar. All editing software does the same thing. Um, but, um, yeah, some, uh, some good tips in there, I think, and, um, just good stuff overall, and, uh, it was cool to see, to see it all come together, and, uh, yeah, not really much more to say beyond that. It was it was just a very interesting video, especially for someone who does make YouTube content, even if mine doesn't begin to compare to what James does. Um, it's uh, it's pretty cool seeing something like this. Anyway, hope you liked the reaction. Let me know if you did, and see you in the next one.